King goes to Birmingham. He uses nonviolent protest in an attempt to desegregate the largest industrial city of the South. He uses black citizens of the town, including children. comes a time when a movement is judged by its leader. I can't be out of jail while old ladies and children are in. King himself decides to go to jail in spite of the fact that there is danger that he will be killed in prison. Protest is continued until Bull Connor, the commissioner of public safety, can no longer make the guards and police turn the hoses on the protesters. The back of the Birmingham authorities is broken. Turn on the hose! Turn on the hose! Turn on! Turn on the hose! Martin Luther King had come to Birmingham with a few hundred people. He'd raised an army of thousands. He had filled the jails the way Gandhi had in India. Martin Luther King had desegregated the toughest town in the South. Attorney General Robert Kennedy finds out that J. Edgar Hoover has sent out a dossier of rumors, slander, and innuendo about King. Kennedy protests it's being sent out without his consent. Mr. Hoover. I know that you've done a great deal of service for this country, but I think that for any man to have as much power for as long as you have is not only wrong, but it's dangerous. It's terribly dangerous. Now, now I want back every copy of this so-called monograph. It's already gone out. I am ordering you to get them back. And I believe I'm your superior. No attorney general has ever said that to me before. No president has ever said that before. King takes his followers on the most dangerous march of their existence, from Selma to Montgomery, the cradle of the Confederacy, to dramatize the right of every citizen to vote. There is danger in every one of the 54 miles. Viola Liuzzo, a Detroit housewife, transports students to be in Montgomery for the arrival of the marchers the next day. A car pulls up alongside hers. Last Sunday, 8,000 of us started on a mighty walk from Selma, Alabama. All right. They said we wouldn't get here. Hmm? There were those who said that we would get here only over their dead bodies. All right. Yet today, all the world knows that we are here. Yes. Sir. And we are standing before the forces of power in the state of Alabama. Saying we ain't about to turn around. Now for part three of King.
I've been thinking about taking one of them positions they've been offering me. Could you? I don't know why I couldn't take off a couple of years anyway. Do you, do you think you could leave the movement for that long? Oh, sure. I mean, there's Andy. He's come along fine, and Ralph, of course. You know what I was really thinking about? You know, I've never been home when our last three babies were born. Unless I do something, I'm going to miss their childhood. I'm going to miss it forever. <laughs> well, put that thing out of my oh, face. Now, Bernard, Bernard, put it on, put it on Bunny, the birthday girl. Now, go on. He's going to break that candle. <laughs> that costs too much money. Go on. It's her party. Go on. Oh, they have mercy. able to accept a position as pastor. There was Watts, and there was Vietnam. We want to welcome you. Chicago is a big town. It likes to welcome big people. And you're one of the biggest. We welcome Martin Luther King, Nobel Prize winner, who fights for the betterment of America. All right-thinking people share his views. And we have a whole schedule for you, a march through the loop to the lakefront, an appearance on the Today Show. Uh, Dr. King didn't come here just to make appearances this time. He came here to talk about jobs and housing and schools. The schools and housing in Chicago is the best for blacks than any city in the United States. How much you want for this? $90 a month. That's a lot, isn't it? Make up your mind. You won't find anything else at any better rates. I'll take it. This place pays $90 a month unfurnished. Mommy, it smells here. Yoki, we're going to live here for a while. Most of our people live just this way. You didn't tell me Martin Luther King was in the building. We're going to live here. Well, I'll talk to the landlord. He'll get some paint, new furniture, and fix it up a little. No. We'll take it just as it is. Just as it is. This way, gentlemen, right over here. No, you want to get a picture of that? Please? There, take a picture of that right over there. I'm sure you want to have a picture of this right here. You get a picture right over here by the This is our new home. It's nice of you to visit me. I don't usually get such a distinguished visitor. And I'm here to ask you to stop telling our people to burn down their own neighborhoods. That's the last thing I do. They're finding the manhood out there. And I've watched you for a long time. What else do you have to offer besides hate? Hate is something to have. Don't you think it's about time our people had hate? Where does it take them? It takes them to reality and lets them know who the enemy is. So we're no better than they are. They hate, we hate. They use bombs, we use bombs. Who claimed we're any better? You're a racist. 
You've showed great courage. You've done more to desegregate this country than any man who's ever lived. But you see, it didn't cost this country to integrate the lunch counters and buses and toilets. It didn't cost this country to guarantee the right to vote, but to end the poverty for black people in this country and give them a chance to catch up will cost billions and billions of dollars. And somehow, I don't see that being done by appealing to their conscience. We'll find a way. It'll be nonviolent. You still believe in the white man, don't you? I have no choice but to believe in him. I have a choice. I don't expect him to love me. I don't want his love. I court his hatred. I want no part of his society, no part of his values. The dreary truth about the white man is that he is as flawed as everybody else. But not only do I object to you on moral grounds, I object to what you're doing on tactical grounds. If it came down to a show of arms, we are only 10% of the population. You are advocating suicide. <laughs> Maybe, but it's better than living like this. Well, there is something else. There is nonviolent resistance. Are you still talking about Gandhi? You are not Gandhi. You're a middle-class southern preacher's son. What I am isn't important. Why don't you use your charisma, your, your brilliance, to help our people live and not die? Because they hurt us too much. Because there's no living with him. Because he'll lie and deceive us in the end. The final truth isn't that you hate the white man. You see, you hate being black. You can't see beyond your own personal rejection. This country respects violence. Sometimes I think it's the only thing that it respects. You hold on to your position. You get discredited by your own people. Martin, I can help those demonstrations in Chicago succeed. Modify your stance on nonviolence. We'll appear nationally together. It's the best thing for our people. I can't. At least we have one thing in common. We're both dead men. <laughs> I love you. You may not believe it. But it's true. I love you. You're a glorious fool.